It's Wednesday, February 9. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. We begin today's newscast with updates from Wednesday's post cabinet press briefing hosted at the office of the Prime Minister. Minister of Information Robert Morgan says Cabinet has given approval to specific policy directives regarding the cockpit country protected area. As well as the environmental permits related to Special Mining Lease 173 to be issued to Naranda Bauxite Partner 2 under the, National, the Natural Resources Conservation Authority Act 1991. We also got the approval of Cabinet for the Government of Jamaica United Nations Development Program Global Environment Finan Facility Project valued at 49 million um, US dollars entitled Conserving Biodiversity and Reducing Land Degradation using an integrated approach to be implemented over a six year period commencing in the 2022-2023 financial year. Cabinet also approved the government's co-financing commitment in kind and cash to the project of US $43.1 million. He says the cabinet has approved a provision for funding activities relative to the program in upcoming national budgets. Jamaica's agricultural produce increased in the last quarter of 2021. Preliminary estimates for domestic crop production for the October to December quarter of 2021 shows an increase of 18.2% over the corresponding quarter of 2020. Portfolio Minister Pernell Charles Jr. cited the increase during his address at the Ministry's virtual press briefing on Tuesday. And this resulted in an increase in the last quarter's production, making it one of the best performing quarters ever recorded. In fact, production was 4.5% higher when compared to the previous quarter, July to August. He says Jamaica's overall domestic crop production moved from 697,678.8 tons in 2020 to 770,456.2 tons in 2021 representing a 10.4% increase. The increase is attributed to a continuation of the sector's growth trend over the past four years, which represents the highest ever production for the sub-sector. Local Government and Rural Development Minister Desmond McKenzie toured the flood-damaged parishes of St. Anne, St. Mary and Portland on Wednesday. He led a special ministerial team to assess conditions and pave the way for further interventions to assist affected parishioners. Sections of those parishes were inundated with heavy rains last week. Local Government and Rural Development Minister Desmond McKenzie has commended Rural Water Supply Limited for their rainwater harvesting project, which was recently implemented at the Springfield Primary and Infant School in St. Elizabeth. The project, which was undertaken last year by the RWSL, includes the installation of five tanks at Springfield Primary, two 1,000-gallon tanks, two 800-gallon tanks, and one 15,000-gallon concrete tank. The initiative will benefit some 162 students and staff at the institution. After a recent tour of the institution, Mr. McKenzie told journalists that, quote, Water harvesting has been a feature of the ministry since 2016, and RWSL has strengthened the capacity of the ministry to deliver. End quote. On Tuesday, the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation recognized six individuals who have given human service to the parish's shelter management program. The recipients have collectively rendered 153 years of service to the program. They are Winston Jackson, posthumously, Derek Coward, Alberta Jackson, Cynthia Bravo, Carolyn Evans, and Iris Jack. They were recognized during a ceremony following the council meeting at the Jamaica Conference Center in downtown Kingston. Mayor of Kingston, Senator Councillor Delroy Williams, commended the volunteers for their years of dedicated service to the program and the municipality. 
Dance hall artist turned Christian, Minister Marion Hall, has announced that she will be walking away from preaching on social media. Minister Hall, known formally in the dance hall space as Lady Saw, made the announcement on Instagram Tuesday and started trending almost immediately. Britain's Prince William and his wife Kate are expected to visit Jamaica in a few weeks as part of a Caribbean tour to mark the Queen's 70 years of service. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge will also be visiting Commonwealth nations on the trip. The couple's visit comes months ahead of the 60th anniversary of Jamaica's independence from Britain in August. The World Health Organization, the WHO, says a subvariant of the Omicron variant of COVID-19 is about to increase in circulation globally. The WHO's COVID-19 technical head, Maria Von Kakov, says the Global Health Agency is tracking four different versions of Omicron. The virus is circulating at a very intense level. Um, we have the Omicron variant, which is the fifth variant of concern that WHO has classified as a variant of concern at the global level. But you have to remember that this virus still continues to evolve. There are four sublineages of Delta, uh, excuse me, of Omicron that we're tracking. So let me say that again. So there are four sublineages of Omicron that we are tracking. We have the BA.1, the BA.1.1, the BA.2, the BA.3. This is all Omicron. The WHO executive reiterates that Omicron is more transmissible than other COVID-19 variants. At a global level and as an organization, what we're doing and working with, with governments, we're working with our partners to do two major things. One is to increase vaccination coverage among those who are most at risk in all countries, not just some countries, and making sure we reach that 70% target by June 2022. But we're also trying to do everything that we can to support the reduction in transmission. We will not be able to prevent all transmissions. That's not the goal. To prevent all infection and all transmission, that's not attainable at this point, but we need to drive transmission down because if we don't, we will not only see more cases, more hospitalizations, more deaths, we will see more uh, people suffering from post-COVID condition, long COVID, and we will see more opportunities for variants to emerge. Global oil prices have stabilized. We get this plus other financial market updates in this quick business report with Gabriel Thompson. In foreign exchange trading for Tuesday, February 8, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $157.70. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $124.72. The pound sterling traded for $213.76 and the euro sold for an average $181.41. In Tuesday's trading session, the following reflect the movement of the JSE indices. The JSE index closed at over 300,000 units. The junior market index advanced by 61 points to close at over 4,000 units. The combined market index advanced by 532 points to close at just over 400,000 units. And the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 994 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 105 stocks of which 54 advanced, 35 declined and 16 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Access Financial Services Limited and Barita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, Berger Paints Jamaica Limited, and Blue Par Group Limited. Trading firm were 1834 Investments Limited, CAC 2000, 9.5% Preference Shares, and Carreras Limited. QWI Investments Limited was the volume leader with over 4.8 million units, followed by Wickton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 3.6 million units, and Spur Tree Spices Jamaica Limited with over 3.5 million units. In market data for oil, prices were stable around $90 a barrel on Wednesday, but the prospect of increased supply from Iran and the United States kept pressure on the market. Brent crude futures edged down 36 cents or 0.4% to $90.42 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate crude fell 43 cents or 0.4% to $88.93 a barrel. 
The contract slid about 2% on Tuesday as Washington resumed indirect talks with Iran to revive a nuclear deal. An agreement could lift U.S. sanctions on Iranian oil and quickly add supply to the market, although a number of vital issues still need to be ironed out. And with that, we close this Wednesday edition of the Business Report inside the news on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Pleasant viewing. In keeping with the recent recognition of World Cancer Day, in today's Living Healthy, we consider the question, what do you do when the diagnosis is cancer? It's something we all fear, but cancer is not a death sentence. In this episode, Dr. Heather Lawson Myers shares hopeful tips on how to prevent, respond to, and fight this pothole in life. Hey David, I'm here. Listen, welcome to another episode of HD's Jazz, where we're on a journey to appreciating the value of good oral health. I told you that I'm going to take you to a secret place, but I'm revealing that secret place today. It's the Riverhead, a place of hope, because today we're going to talk about what to do when you're given the diagnosis of cancer. You want your body to be as healthy as possible before you begin this fight against cancer. So, a trip to the dental office can ensure that any underlying oral infections, any dental disease, or any amount of inflammation is removed so that your immune system can be at its best to fight off this disease. Chemotherapy, which uses cytotoxic drugs, is used to prevent the reoccurrence of cancer. Radiation zooms in on specific portions of the body to kill the cancer cells. Both modalities rely on survival of the fittest. That's not the time you want to have a dental emergency because it surely will complicate your treatment. A trip to the dental office to have your examination to have your x-rays done, to have any treatment that needs to be done out of the way, properly prepares you to step into the next phase of treatment. Just as how these ginger lilies are blooming, I want you to bloom with hope as we work together to lessen the chances of any complications to your treatment. Make your dental office the first stop along this fight. We'll partner with you and show you the value of good oral health. Listen, catch me next time. Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and our LFD website. See you next time on HD's Jazz. some stories making headlines across the region. In St. Lucia, Prime Minister Philippe J. Pierre will seek to increase the financial allotment available under the Distress Fund in the 2022-2023 budget. That's according to Castries Central Member of Parliament, Richard Frederick, whose constituency has been affected by a number of fires over the past few years. More in this HDS News Force report. Losing all your belongings to a fire or natural disaster is never easy. In December 2021, five people at Bishop's Gap Marsha Castries were left without a place to call home after a fire destroyed three structures. 
Earlier in September, in the same neighborhood, a 10-year-old was left traumatized after witnessing the sight of an abandoned building going up in smoke and threatening nearby homes. Now the SLP government plans to reinstate the distress fund in the upcoming budget to provide financial assistance to persons stricken by disasters like fires. Castry Central MP Richard Frederick, speaking to reporters on Monday, reaffirmed the government's commitment to revive the fund. His words of assurance followed the destruction by fire of another abandoned structure in a densely populated area, this time at Active Hill Le Clary on Monday morning. There is something in place. It was removed by Alan Shastley's administration, but I can tell you without any fear of an iota of contradiction that in come this budget, this million dollars, when it was 700,000, a million dollars has been put in place for the distress fund. The distress fund was the brainchild of former Prime Minister Dr. Kenny Anthony. However, the support system was dismantled by the Alan Shastny regime, which replaced it with an arbitrary selection process in the office of the Prime Minister. The United Workers' Party, the previous administration, had removed the distress fund. Um, Shastny is on record as asking people to go get insurance for their charters, their wooden structures. The SLP government will attempt to increase the fund by some $300,000 as a line item in the 2022 estimates of expenditure. Philip J. Pierre, this current Prime Minister, has not only replaced the distress fund, but he has augmented it from 700000 to a million dollars a year. In case any of our persons encounter natural calamities, there is some sort of assistance that is catered for. Minister for Equity Joachim Henry in December 2021 announced that the SLP administration was going to reinstate the distress fund after a family of eight lost their home in a fire at Moshi. It should be noted, however, that the ex-Prime Minister Alan Chastney suggested implementing a policy framework for the provision of some level of insurance to secure possessions and belongings, but never followed through on such a plan. The current House Speaker Claudius Francis also recently made a similar recommendation of insurance of small dwellings. Gina Filippi, HTS News Force. In Trinidad and Tobago, Minister of Public Utilities Marvin Gonzalez has commended statements made by the UNC Women's Arm. This after St. Augustine MP Khadija Amin questioned the status of the streetlights at the Heights of Aripo during a candlelight vigil and prayer on such Saturday. In response, Minister Gonzalez said lights were installed last July and more will be installed when resources become available. Also responding to claims, the MP for Arima, Penelope Beckles, said Ms. Amin is using the recent discovery of a woman's body in the area for political purposes. Government is not uh, looking after the people, uh, the safety of the people of the Heights of Aripo. That is totally false. Member of Parliament for Arima, Penelope Beckles, refuted the claims made by members of the UNC Women's Arm. I am very, very clear in my mind that I continue to seek the interests of the people of Aripo. Aripo is a special, the Heights of Aripo is a very special village, very dear to my heart. Um, and, I mean, I gave them that assurance yesterday, and I will do it again, that they have the 100% support of their Member of Parliament. In July, Minister of Public Utilities Marvin Gonzalez and the Arima MP oversaw the installation of LED lights and light poles in the area. This was done after a request was made by the MP. The residents benefited and the community of Aripo benefited from 14 new light poles mm -hmm. as well as 32, 32 new LED lights. He said the lights were installed after consultation with the Aripo Village Council to determine the areas where they are needed most. The country is aware of that area where, you know, bodies um, have been reported to be dumped and, um, and lights were also placed in that particular area. Minister Gonzalez said street lighting projects in the area will be continued. 
there is a plan to continue with the with the street lighting um, program, and as soon as resources are um, are available, we will continue to work with the village council and the member of parliament office to identify other areas where we can um, increase and extend the, uh, you know our street lighting program. He said resources of the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission are spread equitably across the country. Mahalia Joseph Wharton, TTT News. Budget your money. That's the advice coming from Super Value Executive, who is predicting further increases in grocery store prices across the Bahamas. This, as local businesses and residents are expressing their dissatisfaction with the hike in prices. Bethany McDermott reports. Businesses and residents feeling the pinch amid an increase in grocery store prices. Tropical Euro owner chef Kevin Colmer said he's seen a remarkable increase in the price of meat in recent months. My meat went up from $67 a case to $167 a case in June of last year. Our news ventured inside and found some items that saw a remarkable increase, like this bag of large cooked panami shrimp priced at $43.99. Colmer isn't alone. Others expressed their dissatisfaction as they left a popular the grocery store. Check this receipt. I even need one. Look. <laughs> this receipt is ridiculous. Couple yeah. items. Couple and items. I'm spending $200 Buddy. on four, sometimes two and, and three items. And look at that. Look for that. This ain't right. This, this you got to do better. You got to do better. We, we, we put you there. You got to help us. Look like the price man will probably want just with everything. Bread now is so basically like four something. The mayonnaise going up. They're about not normal seven, nine dollars. The price on just with everything has gone up. As far as I see, everything I buy, it's go up more and more every day. One time it like Jeff Stimulus on the cooking oil jumped from, from twelve fifty to twenty six dollars. According to Super Value Chief Financial Officer Debbie Simonet, there seems to be no end in sight for what seems to be increasing grocery store prices. She said the company itself has been experiencing price hikes from its suppliers. While she said the company has been making attempts to hold off on price hikes by buying ahead, an increase in prices is inevitable. Back in August, Super Value owner Rupert Roberts warned consumers of a 15% price hike in early 2022. Simonet sought to explain other factors contributing to the rise. It can be anything from the labor, it could be a labor problem or um, a shutdown of a factory, uh, shortage of supply. Um, and then, you, of course, we have the big trucking issue where, or the shipping, well, both of them actually. Shipping, um, you see the big ships in the harbor unable to move because the, the cargo is still piled on the ships. Um, suppliers are not able to get their goods off of the ship on a timely basis. Now, many were under the impression that the change in value-added tax to 10% would result in a decrease in grocery store bills. But according to Simonet and a few consumers we spoke to today, that hasn't been the case. You also must remember there was a 10% increase because on bread basket items there was no VAT before and now there's VAT on those items. So that is coupled with the, the inflation that has presented itself lately. So it's a double whammy. So for my business especially, that, that equates to you know, a few hundred dollars a week extra. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. In sports, we're in the creases with cricket. Cricket West Indies has announced that the West Indies Championship 2022 will start on Wednesday, marking the return of first-class cricket in the region since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And special arrangements are being made to help teams continue in the tournament if COVID-19 infections impact their squads. In unveiling the match schedule for the first two rounds of the championship as part of a five-round tournament schedule for the six professional regional franchises on Monday, CWI said it is implementing a special player loan system to try to ensure that each 15-member team will be able to complete their fixtures. It explained that if a team has players ruled out due to a positive COVID-19 result, they can request to use players from another team and or from a pool of locally registered reserve players. Defending champions Barbados Pride will face Leeward Islands Hurricanes in the first match at Kensington Oval. Home team Trinidad and Tobago Red Force host Jamaica Scorpions at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy in Trinidad, while the newly named Guyana Harpy Eagles face Windward Islands Volcanoes at Queen's Park Oval in Trinidad. And with that, we pull up stumps on yet another newscast. Join us tomorrow, same time, same place, as we do it all over again. You've just watched the news on PBCJ. We are the People's Station.